Hello, everyone. Hello there. Hello, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you might be. How are you guys? Oh, I'm, I'm feeling rather weary. I've had a very long day um, trying to get in uh, all the Eastern Town Hall proposals, sorting them out, getting them into shape, finalising them all. So uh, had a long, long day. How about you guys? Aiden, now well, you're a new face, Aiden. Where you're coming to me, at least you're a new face. So uh, where where you're where are you coming in from? Aiden, yeah, no, it's out on the service. Are, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Great. Yeah, no, excited to be here. Uh, it was really cool hearing all of the different languages being spoken and how Cardano is kind of, I just love seeing the adoption grow. And I know these communities existed already, but actually seeing them kind of speak and interact. And I just haven't been able to see that before. So that was really exciting. Uh, that's good. That's good to hear. Uh, hello, Joram. How are you today? Excellent. Thank you. Great to be here from Geneva. Mm -hmm. What do you mean from Geneva? Yeah, and uh, Ken, where are you coming in from? Uh, I'm here in Malawi, Southeast Africa. That's cool. And Darlington, good to see you again. How are you? Good morning, everyone. Doing well. Yeah, I think it's right. It's in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's quite early for me over here. Yeah, what, what time is it over there for you? Um, seven. Oh, yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah. Uh, Dippin, how are you today? Hey, I'm doing okay. Still just reached home from work. So nice to be here. And let's see what we can achieve today. And hopefully we have the answer for our last, last week question. Oh, shoot. What was it? I do remember now. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's, it's about the how the reward um, the distribution voting is going to work like is it like everyone gets the voting is it or is it only one person basically how the voting is going to happen for if I can't remember now yeah? in the catalyst I did look it up I, I, I went and looked in the catalyst I can't remember uh, brain's not working today. That's okay. <laughs> brain's not working yeah, today. I know it's quite late here. Really. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, Benjamin, <laughs> you're a new face here. How about you tell us uh, about yourself a little bit? Hi, everyone. I'm actually based uh, in Singapore. So, yes. And uh, it's my first time here. It's very kind of interested to kind of learn more about Cardano and wanted to join the community. It's Sort of speed up the process a little bit, and yeah, that's what got me here. Okay, cool, that's cool. And Derek, yeah, and from Florida, if I recall correctly, is that right? Yes, sir, that's pretty close. I am in, in Florida now. I probably have a bad internet connection. We just had a tropical storm or a little typhoon pass over, so it's good to see everyone. Yeah, yeah. Reginald, uh, we haven't seen you here before, so uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Don't have to, but if you'd like to, that'd be great. Are you talking to, oh, sorry, Renata? No, Renata, sorry. Oh, sorry. okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, okay. I really, if I slip up on everything today, it's my brain is shutting down. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. uh, good morning. I am from uh, Georgia in the United yeah. States. And uh, I was uh, really following Cardano uh, up until this summer. And I kind of took a couple months off. So I really want to catch up and see where I can get involved. Okay, cool. cool. And Daniel, where, where are you coming in from? Hello, can everyone yeah. hear me? Yeah. Oh, great. Um, it's my first um, 
joining, obviously. Um, I'm calling in from Australia, Brisbane. Uh, it's currently 10.30 a.m. or so p.m. So it's getting a little bit late here. Um, so yeah, I'm obviously be curious. Been uh, seeing the emails getting posted around um, about the east side starting to spool up a bit. I think mean, always been uh, missing the uh, uh, the west side because yeah, that's just like 3 a.m. in the morning. It's just never never been to one of those. So to have the chance to see some faces, I haven't got my camera set up yet, but I'll probably get that set up next time. But um, so yeah, so yeah, just some uh, touching in, seeing how how it all goes, and yeah, look after the. Um, uh, at a stack Cardano staking pool. So mm. I'm a node operator. And um, yeah, nice to meet everyone. Nice to meet you too. Um, I'm Robert. I'm coming in from New Zealand. So it's uh, I'm beating you in terms of the time zone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Greg, who's normally here, couldn't make it today. Um, he he uh, had to put in his apologies, but he's from Melbourne. He normally co-hosts with me as well. So uh he had to put in his apologies today on that side of things. So um, tell me anything um, in terms of what uh, sort of things people are interested in. I can give a little, uh, I might just give a quick little summary of the main town hall this morning, which not too much really covered, just going over the fact that uh, proposals for those that were writing them are now closed, closed at 11 o'clock uh, UTC this morning. Um, so we're now going into the review process, and I also presume if you haven't registered as being a CA, that that's now um, been done. Um, and so if you have had a chance to be a CA, um, to register, then you can go through and start reviewing the proposals, which is really quite an important part of the process. Um, in addition to that, there was sort of um, a introduction about um, the STAR um, funding team, which is a challenge team, which is basically a rapid funding process, a kind of tender process for uh, funding proposals. So what they're doing with is experimenting with a different approach to uh, catalyst funding. And that's coming sort of out of, out of the broader governance architecture. Uh, what else was going on? Um, I think that was really about it in terms of just the fact that we're going through all this new process and just a few little updates around that. Um, yeah, and is how many people here put proposals in? I'm curious. I have. I've done uh, quite a few for the Eastern Town Hall and uh, one of, a few of mine and, and for some other people. We're helping some other people as well. Um, so, um, right, well, all the best with uh, the reviews and, and going through that process. And just a reminder of those the video for, I think Daniel said that the video uh, email for getting a summit video out for your proposal is going to go out in a couple of hours. Um, and uh, you, they have to be in, I think, around Monday or something else like that. Five, five minute video of your proposals if you want to. So Ken, I can see a, a, a pony in your video yeah. <laughs> going on. Um, right, well, um, what would people want to talk about, discuss, any well, questions? I have a question. I have a question. What, what time the Catalyst Advisor starts? What time it starts normally the process there? Um, basically, as far as I'm aware, it starts right now. Um, you can start going in and starting to review them and, and go through. Uh, it may be a slight delay on it. Um, I've never actually been a CA personally myself. Um, and, okay. But this one, one of the things that I've actually, usually because I've had some proposal in or was related, related to some proposal in one of the funds, so I couldn't be a CA. Whereas this time you can, if you've got a proposal in, you can be a, a CA as well. The only requirement is that you don't uh, review any proposals that uh, is in the same challenge as yours. Um, so uh, you know, as long as you've That's registered, hmm, you'll be good to go. Yeah, okay, good. I'm trying it this time, both first time for making proposals and first time being a CA, so. Yeah, it's yeah. so all good. Um, you're, it's important to basically uh, review the proposals for the, your purpose as a CA is essentially to 
be a guide for the voters. So to review them for uh, all the proposals from that point of view around three questions, um, and then you go from there, uh, you know, think about what would be useful for the voters when you're actually reviewing them. Um, and there's pretty strong guides and obviously there's a, a CA school that Cather School's doing and there's also uh, video uh, videos out there um, of, of it being recorded. Um, right, now, I, I, that question Dippin is now bugging me and I'm trying to remember what it was exactly. <laughs> so it might pop back into my head at some point, but we'll see how it's going on. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, anything else in terms of uh, thoughts and, or points of discussion that people want to cover? No? Was well, to... there um, a bit of a tangent, um, but was there a decision at the formation of this Eastern Town Hall to not have the the translation run in parallel was was that a was that a intention intentional thing uh yes it was intentional at this point in time partly because of just the effort really to try and sort all of that out as we're just sort of finding our feet and figuring out what will work and what doesn't so that was a decision not to do okay. translation because it actually complicates the the back end process quite a bit and so we just want to sort of keep that uh, simple for the moment and uh, keep the uh, rooms relative, uh, the, the main room relatively short. Uh, so today's one was a bit longer than usual, but we usually just have the sort of welcome. And that also helps with sort of exposing people to just the different languages and stuff as well, which we think is quite good. Quite good to do. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, so. Anyone want to, well, uh, yeah, any topics or questions that you want answered at all today? Yeah, I was thinking about the Corona Summit, which is happening all across the world. Um, it's not happening in Singapore. Like, uh, what did it, nobody submitted it? Or was it like, is it because of the local regulation it's not happening? I was, I was seriously hoping something to pop up over here. Uh, it was basically, it would have been because no one's uh, stood up to say, put their hand up to say, hey, let's run a run a um, community summit here in Singapore. Uh, that would be the main wow. reason. You were given an option, okay. well, well, there was an ability to, when you registered for the summit, an ability to suggest when you're doing and push that through. So it was really just that uh, uh, someone hasn't put their hand up to, to do it. So, um, oh. yeah, okay. which is, Bit of a shame, but I haven't got one here. I thought about it here for New Zealand. I thought, no, I've got too much on my plate. <laughs> so I think I'll <laughs> keep my hand in my pocket and not say anything then. <laughs> um, we're, yeah, we're, okay. Yeah. So there is a one one in Sydney, I think, and I think there's also possibly one in Melbourne. I can't quite remember on that front. But yeah. So yeah. And uh, so um, anyone want to just talk through their proposals or anything else like that? Uh, we've gone through some in Darlington stuff. I saw that you guys were featured in the town hall uh, today with uh, Lido Nation stuff, Darlington today. You, were, you gave a, a summary update of stuff. Uh, yeah, we we um then Derek, you can go next. Uh, we uh, partner up with um Codano community or Catalyst community. Um, um, I there's two projects that kind of look similar and they both have Catalyst in the URL. <laughs> One is like that org and the other is that SC. And my brain is still, but George, George and um Patrick um. We're going to be working with them, and that kind of reduced the scope on my proposal because uh, we, we both were both after the same thing of having all of the proposal information as in Catalyst um, be in a defined, predictable structure and then available as an API 
that's open and public that anybody can use to build whatever they want to build. Uh, we on Lighter Nation, we already have a directory of proposals that's on there that's being used very heavily. Um, but that whole interface is not really meant for the ongoing catalyst process. It, it's meant to be more of a research tool, a lurker tool, like people outside the space to kind of look at what's happening in the Kodano community without having to create logins or like commit to anything. Um, and so it's being used in that sense. Um, people are kind of checking out what's coming in Cardano. Whereas on the catalyst.org website, that's more meant for people in Catalyst, voting, um, um, finding, uh, finding, finding proposals that don't have reviews and things like that during the, the initial review process. Um, but that if we had a, a data, an API, we could both use that same API for different use cases. So what I'm gonna focus on, my background is like backend and software engineering and cloud stuff. So I focus on getting that API set up and all of the, the server infrastructure spun up. And then George will focus on um, the, the front end and some of the GraphQL stuff and any kind of UI stuff. And, and then some of that data um, standardization. Um, yeah, so that's really exciting. Uh, George is already funded for some of that data stuff, so I will, I will, I will onboard onto that foundation fund five and start helping with some of that work. And then if we get funded in fund six, you all will have an open API that you can all pull Catalyst data from. So check it out. There's a there's a there's a thirty minute video that George released on his YouTube channel about the data part and the importance of that. My part is pretty boring. So if everything works, you should even know that it's me, it should just work. <laughs> oh, you're muted, Robin. Yeah, yeah. Oh. one of the things I am interested in is obviously uh, uh, pulling the proposal text uh, you get uh, out of Catalyst. Is, is that uh, something that you'll be providing? I want to, so my approach to it, if the project is funded, is from the get-go, start with it being an open source GitHub repository where there can be community collaboration on what exactly comes out of that API. Um, so so yeah, that would be, um, if, 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 if that specific thing is in, immediately in my head, there will definitely be opportunity from day one just to create issues for, for things people want to see in there. Um, and that way too, because right now, one of the, the hiccup with the data pipeline, there is some, it's not clear why, but there's something about idea skill and, and privacy. And so that would, we don't even have access to that data yet. Um, but one of my motivations for even starting open in the beginning is the entire community can participate and 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 plus or thumbs up or comment on these GitHub issues that can kind of show the 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 need. So I always get to put pressure on ideas to get mm -hmm. some of that hiccup figured out. Uh, so yeah, everything will be open from the beginning, and this will be an open source project. That's cool. Because one of the things that I was just looking at is um, how we can increase the um, or translate various different proposals easily. So right. we're doing, doing right. a little bit of that at the moment. And the idea would be to, I mean, I've just sort of set everything up and get with Markdown. Uh, and the idea if you, is, is if you can pull them out of uh, uh, idea scale and put some minimal sort of formatting around them, then push them through a bit of machine translation to kick the process off. Then you, know, you speed up translations and therefore make a lot of the content more accessible. Idea Scale does have some machine learning sort of stuff in there, but it's uh, pretty bad from all accounts uh, in terms of what it does. And in particular, because uh, when we, I think we discussed this last week or something was that uh, the language is quite new in the space so there's a whole lot of different mm -hmm. terms so what does staking mean uh you know for example to a machine probably right. a great idea so 
getting that sort of pipeline going would be uh, pretty cool from an open API. Uh, Derek, what are you? Yep, go ahead, Quasar. Darlington, it's wonderful to see you. And it's good to, good to see you and, and hear you. Um, did anyone have it or listen to the Charles, Charles video about the scam alerts, the scam squad, uh, matching funds up to a million dollars and getting the foundation for, he started with law enforcement, but really turned it more into a, a, a risk management uh, conversation in my mind. And I was really trying to get my proposals geared towards that, but I was just wondering if anybody else saw the video, saw my post in the forum and what they took out of it, got out of it. And, uh, you know, I think we in Catalyst are going to start seeing Cardano as a whole um, inundated with scams left and right and people, you know, getting paranoid with scams. Um, and quite possibly the whole crypto DeFi space in general starting to get a, a real bumpy road. So I'm just wondering if anybody else is interested in some sort of a risk strategy. Um, I, I haven't seen And, the, and if, the, if, they, if anybody gathered the same thing. Uh, I, haven't, okay. I haven't seen the video specifically uh, that you're mentioning, but I am aware that they are, Look, they've set up some sort of risk center through the foundation, um, and I just haven't looked at it closely enough on that side of things. Um, yeah, there's going to be lots of scams coming in, lots of them. Uh, we're going to pick them up on Catalyst, and just in, we've got all the um, you know stuff that happens on YouTube on an ongoing basis, um, and being able to deal with that is going to be an interesting problem generally, I think. So uh, there should be a lot of uh, fodder to work on in that space, I would have thought, uh, and how we actually solve that. Um, one of the uh, things that will probably come up quite a bit is the notion of reputation and uh, as one device against that. Uh, because as soon as you get into reporting aspects, how do you even, if someone's reporting a scam, how do you know whether that's not a scam, reporting a scam, that sort of thing. And, uh, how to trust it and all these sort of things. So some sort of uh, way of signaling and social validation is actually going to be quite a, an important tool um, in approaching that sort of thing as what, you know, to help with detection um, uh, and uh, follow through. So, yeah. Can you fill us in more in terms of what Charles was talking about and what your understanding of the setup is that they're looking at at the moment? What I heard him say was, Quasar, Derek, go build an enterprise risk management system for the whole crypto community. <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> Ensure the whole thing. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, I, I posted a link to the forum. It's got some timestamped videos in there for you if you'd like to take a look. Um, Ultimately, he wants to be able to hold people accountable and a big push towards educating people so they don't fall victim to uh, the many, many, you know, scams, tricks, uh, just errors. You know, there, some proposals uh, in, in Catalyst this time are actually <laughs> proposing like what a Tyler Prism does, <laughs> you know, like. You're not like you're not offering anything new. That's what it does. I mean, it's not open source or built out, but you know, it's, it's easy. Uh, it'll, well, it'll be easy to make yeah. some. A Tyler Prism will be. Uh, they, their intention is to make it all open source, and there's actually quite a bit of the code base on the Git repositories coming through, and the standards are open as well. So, um, yeah. But um, I was thinking about um, what. Uh, one of the um, proposals that I've put up into Fund 6 is to do something called Ricardian contracts. Um, it's actually intended for 
more for doing sort of compliance sort of related work and being able to instrument um, smart contracts in such a way that uh, they can link back to the human readable terms and conditions that are going on. Um, so recording contracts was something that were defined in about 96, 97 by a guy called Ian Greg. And um, the intention here is that um, smart contracts themselves have a human readable or processes in general have a human readable uh, version of things uh, that can be verified. Uh, there's notions like consent receipts, those sort of things that come into it. So if you're passing data across and giving data, uh, but generally what you're doing there is it's the basis in a sense of actually trying to um, build up reputation of individual smart contracts and helping people understand them. And you can go further and actually have a verified presentation as well. So you can say that this smart, this, these terms or these conditions or what other parameters are in it have, has uh, been presented correctly. You know, so it hasn't been adjusted. So people can start to trust those sort of signals as they come through. Um, as I say, it was actually, it's also really useful. And the primary reason I'll put it in there is because um, I'm interested in things to do with social and, and environmental impact finance. And so uh, it's important that um, outcomes and, and the processes of the financial instruments, et cetera, are linked in some way to a jurisdiction, a legal jurisdiction in some form. And so the um, uh, um, the recording contracts is a way of doing that. It, they're a relatively simple sort of mechanism. And the, the aim here is really just to do uh, a metadata specification for it so that uh, it can be used consistently as a starting point. Um, so that, that's sort of one step. Um, in addition to that, the actual recording contracts themselves can have DIDs. So there's nothing preventing them from having DIDs or to include verified claims, which is all the stuff coming out of the Tala prison to uh, make statements inside of the contracts themselves. And so it's those, to, in my mind, it's those little bits and pieces that help to build something um, bigger and safer on, on that sort of thing. Yeah. I agree with you. Uh, I, I'm afraid that I'm not afraid. I'm very aware that we all have a certain level of literacy that we have to gain and understand mm -hmm. as people are going on. I mean, this whole DeFi crypto, you know, literacy, learning the language itself is very, uh, very confusing. Um, since it's all a prism is a combination of Hyperledger and SideTree, which is what Microsoft uh, uses for their identity overlay network. Uh, it's not Do you see an advantage? They're, um, so they're not using, as far as I'm aware, within the Teleprism, they're not using SideTree just at the moment. Um, uh, I think that's the intention. Most of the verified claims are being stored for the use case of the Ethiopia are being stored on the mobile phones from, from what... Uh, I've heard about what's going on at the moment. The intention is to include stuff like SciTree um, and, and work on that as uh, an approach. What, uh, for those that aren't familiar with SciTree, it's basically a way to anchor uh, verified claims and uh, from external storage into a blockchain. So, um, and so that means that the claims, the actual digital identity documents and the various different claims and resolvers can, uh, aren't stored on a blockchain. Uh, stored on external storage, typically something like a content uh, a, a content addressable storage, so like IPFS, that, Git, whatever you want. And you've got a way to actually bring those changes through such that you can see the updates and stuff coming in, but everything's anchored within the uh, blockchain. Uh, so um, as far as I'm aware at the moment, all the Italo Prism stuff with the verified claims is basically storing it on the mobile phones. Um, that's the approach for version one, at least, in terms of what they're rolling out. Uh, the, the thing to keep in mind with, with the digital identity standards, it's based primarily around the DID standard from the W3C and the verified claim standard from uh, W3C as well. Those are 
basically relatively new standards. There's still a lot of the uh, tools, tooling needed for them, the libraries, uh, and to get all the uh, zero knowledge proof work and the different types of signatures working to reserve privacy and stuff, there's still quite a bit of work going on there um, in terms of that evolving. So yeah, uh, the first version out of the a camp will look good, but it may not be great from a privacy preserving point of view and a decentralization point of view. Yeah. Uh, but those, those sort of things will go a long way to, um, again, with the did stuff, it helps you anchor things. It doesn't have to be an individual, it's documents and code and things like that. It helps you to anchor them to. Um, external systems, that's the whole point of it. The did is basically a ID identifier that can be like a domain name that can be resolved. Um, the key, I, actually, I, I'm surprised, I haven't checked uh, for a while now, but um, no, uh, there wasn't any CIP going up, Cardano improvement process proposal going up for doing a did resolver for Cardano. Um, I checked a few months ago on that one. I didn't see anything, uh, but uh, yeah. Um, so you're, Derek, you're, you're working on what? Uh, the Vehicle Information Service Specification. Okay. Right. Cool. Yeah, a, a large reinsurance company in, in, in uh, Europe and South America uh, leases a lot of automobiles uh, they own the autos they lease them and they provide the reinsurance and uh, yeah they, they're working with uh, an italian share generale um and implementing some uh, uh you know issuing uh dids to to, to vehicles uh, you know hmm. and to, to fleets the you know the people that are leasing them driving them it's really amazing how much of a uh identifier network can be built around something. Hmm. Yeah, uh, there's some uh, a lot of work has gone into the uh, to stand it. Appeals. It seems quite simple, but it originated from all the XRI identifier stuff that uh, quite a few people worked on over the years, um, and then through various iterations, I don't know how Drummond and Manu did it, but um, stuck at it. But they did. And uh, so we've got that standard now. Um, and so I think you'll see all sorts of things getting bids attached to them in all sorts of different ways, uh, used in different purposes. The stuff I'm particularly interested with respect to all that digital identity work is more the Weber Trust work. So whereas a lot of the Tata Prism stuff is anchoring in government issuance of things, I'm quite more interested in the social issuance, the sort of I don't know if any, of you, if any of you are familiar with the uh, GPG Weber Trust uh, stuff that was done in the early 90s and can still be done today, but uh, uh, that's the sort of notion of each other's, we can each uh, verify each other at different levels. And so using the sort of the standard for that would be very good on that area, yeah. So um, I could, in, in uh, more awake days, <laughs> I could talk about the digital identity stuff quite a lot. <laughs> but, but today is not one of those days. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I could too. And Atala Prism is what brought me here, you know? Yeah. So like I, I've been really deep into it and waiting on it. And I just got tricked into it coming here for an ID, you know, like that's, it was the same time, Shelly Summits when I saw the demo and then, you know, that was June or July. Uh, and then Catalyst started in September or October. Mm. Okay, that's, uh, well, that's interesting. That's what brought you in. Uh, um, and you hadn't come across uh, Charles's Bermuda talk uh, from 2014. No, okay. I have not. Yeah, 
I haven't even watched the original whiteboard yet. Like I'm just going to hold off. <laughs> yeah, I still I still haven't watched the original whiteboard. I know I've watched some of the whiteboard sessions, but I haven't watched those ones. Um, I'm interested in like, Dippin or Ronaldo. What sort of things uh, interest you at all? What uh, what stuff is interesting you about this this space? Uh, well. It's mostly the community and uh, trying to see what can be, what we can achieve and see like that. In fact, even I had put up a proposal uh, for around fund six, but unfortunately I won't be able to continue on that because of personal reasons. I thought, okay, I'll just cool down this time and then look at it uh, next round. Um, just mostly a, a crowdfunding uh, related idea stuff, mm. but yeah. Um, and yeah, man, it's nice to listen to you guys um, get to hear a lot of new words, which I've never heard before. Yeah. And <laughs> that's the whole point of being over here. Like you get to hear new stuff. Yeah. And yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I, I know that yeah, normally you're much more energetic. I can, I can completely feel the difference today. <laughs> yeah, I haven't, I haven't yeah. got it today. I mean, I've been up since four o'clock this morning. Yeah. Um, so uh, by wow. the time I finish up, okay. yeah, I'll be nearly sort of standing for about uh, wait for about twenty hours, and I'm just feeling quite exhausted yes, today. Yes. <laughs> so yes, yes energy absolutely. level is a bit lower today, guys, <laughs> on yeah. that front. Yeah. Um, but it's yes. all right. Yeah. And uh, brain brain isn't necessarily connecting dots properly at the moment either. Uh, I was calling my son. Uh, I kept referring to my son, uh, younger son, by his uh, brother's name just before. And I said, okay, brain's gone <laughs> on that front. So, yeah. So, crowdsourcing. Ah, so what um, What were you looking at for that? Even though I know you're not pursuing it, but this is, uh, it's, it, oh, like, for example, um, uh, for the multi language support work that we're trying to do with the Eastern Town Hall, right? Um, ideally, mm -hmm. what, uh, and it's not just Eastern Town Hall, it's all the Spanish communities and stuff like that. I, we want to be able to translate all the, uh, all the um, uh, documentation or the proposals, those sort of things to make it far more accessible, right? So one of the big challenges like, um, and the reasons for doing the Eastern Town Hall was that for a lot of people in East Asia and Asia generally, uh, there's this big language barrier, right? Um, they're not speaking uh, fluent or natively in English. Um, you guys in Singapore obviously have an advantage there, but um, for a lot of the other countries in the area, they don't. And so, um, you know, if, if we're actually, if you take the whole idea of financial inclusion or economic identity broadly, which is sort of like this idea of a financial operating system, and you want it to be secure and robust and everything, then it has to be able to operate pretty much all around the world. And so if you're only just going to focus on North America and uh, Western Europe, uh, then we ain't doing a very good job. Um, so and, and one of the, that's kind of the intent of the Eastern Town Hall. And then to open up, um, one of the big challenges there is the idea of basic language barriers and localization. So, you know, I was, uh, I was having fun with the multi-language proposal today as I was finishing it off because I said, well, you know, this is a perfect application for people to, um, uh, you know, crowdsource translations, build up reputation, right, for contributing to the open knowledge of Kadano, right, and learn while they're doing it, you know, um, and earn. In principle, they can earn. So... Um, it's kind of like a learn to uh, earn to learn type of situation, which I'm quite big on. Uh, like Ken's doing stuff in uh, Moali, teaching his friends to code and stuff like that. Well, hey, this is a great way to sort of get started in the Kadano community and contributing to it by actually doing translation work or localization work. Like later on, we're we're just looking at documents, guides, and um, proposals at the moment but this is going to be a case for um uh d apps the stuff that darlington's doing you know uh, mobile phone apps those sort of things they need localization and special treatment and stuff 
uh, there's video content, podcasts, those sort of things, all of that sort of stuff could then just sort of go through a crowdsourced uh, translation system. Um, and there's various attempts to do that, like you can use Amazon's Mechanical Turk to do the job splitting and, and various different um, serve, translation services do that sort of already, but why not do a native Kodano version of it? Um, so it's... That's good. So was this your proposal or are you saying you, you read this proposal? Uh, this is what I was, it's, um, it's just for the multi-language, um, version of uh, the Eastern Town Hall. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to translate all the, our proposals and stuff. So, and get all that done. So it was just, just really a small proposal to, to set up a little uh, semi-automated uh, translation pipeline uh, to get more people helping with the translation to do it faster. Um, but as I was doing it, I was saying, well, hey, first of all, um, you know, why, why can't we, turn this into something whereby uh, you're, you're getting recognition for your, your contributions, like translations to start with, something really easy on that front. Um, but then it can go a lot further uh, and you can complete certain tasks um, that might be a sign, you know, do this and you'll get paid for it. Um, and, you know, then you, because if you're doing the translations, you've got to have, it's not just one person doing the translation. It's basically, um, you've got to go through a review process and check that it's correct and those sort of things. So it's, you know, you need more than one person just doing a particular language. And I was always really inspired. There was a company called Text Eagle and um, uh, well, which country it was in Mozambique, I think it was, in the, in the mid 2000s that uh, Nokia were, had, uh, funded or working on and the, what they were doing was um, they were they had the need to translate their phones and all the stuff uh, you know the software on their phones and manuals and stuff into all these different languages across Africa so what was happening was you were actually sending out jobs to the herdsmen and things like that on their phones so they could translate uh, a sentence for example and by doing that, they built up reputation and a credit rating and they earned money. So all of a sudden they were sort of got this basis upon which they could then uh, move into the more formalized economy, uh, whether you want that to do that today or not is a different question, but um, uh, that was what you could do with it. Uh, so it was a, I was always sort of quite interested by that. In fact, um, it was a presentation, I gave a presentation on related sort of things many years ago, uh, about over a decade or so ago, which was featured in that. Um, so that was sort of one thing. So I'm curious, I'm always interested in crowdsource, crowdsourcing related things, particularly ones where you can actually be more equitable, right? Not the, the Ubers or the, um, what do you call it, Deliveroo or whatever. But, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mine is definitely not as high tech and complicated as yours is. Like, I, like just summarizing my proposal would be catalyst, the way how catalyst governance work, plus um, a, a community pooling treasury and uh, where there's fund and people can request for it and uh, and, a, and a mix of Kickstarter. It's it's a mix of all these is how I was planning to put in. But in my proposal is still there. It's just that I didn't re refine it. But yeah. Okay. Right. Really, yeah. really nice to really nice to get to know about your. I think uh, Darlington was asking for the for the link. I think you should put oh. up the link. So uh, to yeah, the yeah. proposal. Yeah. I'll just uh, I'll find it. Yes. Um, yes. Um, it's actually up on. A, has it been translated this one yet? Hasn't been translated yet, but um, we've got our, our little uh, um, website uh, under construction, but um, at least it's all working there. And I'll just, uh, so it was the onboarding East Asia proposal. There we are. And you can link off to, it's, um, I don't think this, this is translated yet, but over the next, week it will be yeah 
it's not translated yet. Um, I think Derek has this hand up. Easy. Yeah. Um, so uh, this one was, yeah, I was just looking at it in terms of like I put in, I was having a little bit of fun with it actually, um, uh, because of this, this earn to learn getting scale. So that's what I was uh, sort of thinking of there, what we can do around this. Because the, the, the thing with this technology, right? The thing with, uh, on one hand, it's a, sort of like, it's a ledger, right? So it's a bookkeeping system. But ledgers are actually pretty useful things because they can coordinate a lot of activity, okay? Um, and you know, another name for a ledger is a registry. And so you've got all sorts of things like property titles, you know, ownership records, um, all sorts of things like that. And it's those uh, um, facts that are stored in a registry that we can trust, right? So we're talking about the recording contracts earlier, vehicle ownership, those sort of things. These facts, if we can trust them at least trustlessly, we don't have, you know, uh, we can then actually start to coordinate more effectively. Um, and we'll get better at it. So in this sense, this technology amplifies our ability to coordinate, not just in a national area, uh, which is typically a required, um, you know, the court system, legal system to help maintain that. We can now do it globally really effectively and low, at a low cost. And so crowdsourcing is a really good example of those sort of things. Um, and it also makes the ability of, um, you know, the, the business models change now because um, normally what's happening within a lot of the, the space and the technology is that um, uh, like with the web, for example, was we've socialized the production of content and everyone can produce content now, but um, the value capture kind of keeps going into one direction, right? So the idea here is now you, you're changing the value, the equation for value capture as well. So because we can coordinate more effectively. Right? So now we've got new types of business or collaborative business models that just weren't that practical before or relied on volunteerism a lot, right? And so that's why I like this notion of earn to learn, right? Um, you go do something that now is possible where you can contribute to the public good, in this case, knowledge about Kadano, knowledge about Catalyst. You can learn uh, stuff while you're doing that, you know, so completing a task, you don't have to do rote repetition over and over again. Uh, um, and you can earn. I mean, what if you could just totally flip the whole education sector? Yeah. You know, because at the moment it's get around debt. You go off and get a big massive debt, right, to go and get your tertiary education or whatever. And, um, you know, and there's no guarantee that you have a decent paying job to pay it back at the end of it. Yeah. Uh, so what tends to happen is people gravitate towards certain professions that they know they can earn. A lot of money in, and that's not necessarily good from uh, for society's benefit overall. So anyway, um, that's that's the proposal that uh, for the just setting up a simple sort of uh, language translation pipeline, which just using Git basically, and uh, and to set up a Git workflow and get people used to using it. Markdown. Um, and uh, just using it as a starting point. That's what that one's about. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a perfect candidate for crowdsourcing. It totally is. And I'm definitely watching you guys too, quite closely because I like, would definitely want to tap into something like that. And um, in the thing you were saying about, um, a good a reputation system through the through the system and and you can imagine you know if if the resource that gets launched become a known issuer of dids um so that translates to that translators then you can have completely third-party independent systems 
that can just start, you can have different trust models for, for NFTs of, 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 of translators coming from that system. So I can have a translator perhaps hooking to my localization system and, and they will receive a higher amount of trust for translating something if they're using, if they're signing yeah, translation with the NFT um, that has a did in there that was issued by, you know, your system or whatever that, that yeah, other system that, is. That's right, yeah. um, but, right the, the reputation becomes portable, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's just the, the chain reaction of, of more efficient economic activity that can come from that. So, yes, keep going. Mm -hmm. um, one of these days, I would, I would, I would jump in and help. <laughs> yeah, this, this, this one, I, I, when we sort of started putting it together, it's just sort of like, okay, yeah. um, this would be quite, quite good, and look, because it is something I've thought about quite a while. Um, but I was, uh, mm -hmm. so I was having a little bit of fun with this, this particular proposal in terms of the future possibilities, because I, I, I do right, know right, um, and and what we can do. How are you, Oliver? Coming in from uh, Sydney. Yeah, not so bad. Yeah. I was just at the color school thing, um, but I thought it'd be more fun over here. So I came back. I, I, I don't know. I'm feeling a bit weary today <laughs> after all the proposal work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not there. Uh, proposal mentor people, or whatever they were called. Like you're helping other people, or they're all your proposals? um eastern town hall ones there was five i did for that and then uh about three others for some other people and then um the four proposals that i put up so a few we've had, uh, reputation systems before were we yeah definitely. yeah we're definitely we're, yeah favorite, favorite topic of mine or topic of interest at least a topic of interest well, oh yeah yeah okay. composite composition of uh reputation there you go <laughs> Yeah, no. yeah, uh, and did you look any more? Uh, I'm going to have a little sideline conversation here with all of it. Did you have a look at any more of that um, uh, 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 category theory, game theory stuff? Uh, I haven't managed to get too deep yet. Um, you know, it's on the never ending list. Uh, right, okay, cool. Yeah. Well, do let me know <laughs> on that front. Um, so, Dippin, you did actually um, bring up another point there about the kind of Kickstarter-ish side of things. Um, so, in reference to your uh, comment that, yeah, not as complicated as mine, I have a tendency to make things complicated. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, I went through your last proposal. I was reading through it, reading through it. It's like, it's not getting over. Like, it's like reading through it. It's pretty long. I went to your last fun five proposal. I was like, okay, oh my God. It's like pretty, when we read through, it's like pretty complex. And yeah, like, I know it, it, you need a lot of patience and energy to go through the whole content. Yeah. But yeah. you write it very well, detail. Uh, that I should really appreciate. Your writing is really good. Mm. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, I've put, I've split that, those uh, to that big one because, um, you know, I, I didn't actually expect to get funded for that, um, which I didn't, mainly because uh, the full, the challenge was actually quite small and that um, I knew I was pushing against the idea of what DeFi was, uh, which was, you know, that um, DeFi people in there for the yield, yeah. Give me the money. That's what they're in there for. And I was going in with uh, here's some reusable components, guys. So you can stitch them together. So two of the proposals that I've put up are basically breaking that out into uh, two parts. Um, but the, uh, the the one around conditional finance is very relevant to the idea of Kickstarterish type of work. Um, it's, uh, and that's what, uh, in finance, um, Kickstarter is known as an assurance contract, which is, um, yeah, they don't get funded until everyone else is actually committed. It's, um, so it's a, it's a mechanism to 
basically try and get people to put fund the project knowing that if it doesn't reach a threshold level um, they'll get their money back that's the assurance component of it um, and so the uh, conditional finance one is somewhat similar you don't uh, and it's very relevant to sort of different forms of um, funding things like catalyst um, at the moment we're going through a grants program that's all catalyst is at the moment fundamentally um, that's only one type of funding mechanism and it's actually quite a, uh, a relatively expensive funding mechanism by that i mean that it actually requires us to be cas it requires us to vote those sort of things um, and it doesn't necessarily create a nice good clean signal of what actually the community's preference is. So, um, so that's what two of the two of the proposals was breaking those two bits out of that big proposal that I had up in fund five um, on that front. Yeah. So, so if I may, uh, if I may add to your question, I would really, really, really like to see a proposals in much uh, layman, uh, idiot proof. For example, is like anyone can understand it uh kind of get it low less complicated and the, the the message the message can be out it's just that try to get it in much yeah it's, it, it, it's a perennial challenge i face i have to say uh <laughs> stuff i do um um yeah ken yeah well, one of the things that i've been thinking about is um ways to to try to to push towards a limited vocabulary so if you keep track of all the vocabulary that's used in different proposals and then you you weight each one based on how how often a word's used or something um you can maybe have have um some way of of visualizing that some words are not commonly used within the whole ecosystem. That's sort of one of the things I've been thinking about. Yeah, so I mean, this is this is an interesting area because you know, um, so I'm from a very technical background. Uh, so is Oliver, so is Darlington, so is Ken. You know, we've got technical backgrounds um, at different sort of levels. I happen to have a, a technical background, which includes finance, that includes a lot of computer science, that includes things like doing high performance computing. And um, so I'm familiar with a lot of stuff. And, um, and I do market design work, that's what I do. Um, and so you can explain the idea pretty simply, and that's what we actually tried to do that in uh, the the proposal videos actually. Um, well, um, so I'll see if I can. Oh, I won't bring them up. But uh, the challenge we decided to do with this one was like, see, if, can we explain them simply into a sort of like one minute, thirty second video with a bit of motion graphics and stuff like that? So it'd be interesting to know because it is a um, if you thought that the Fun Five proposal was full of language, um, I couldn't help myself. But <laughs> um, I don't know if you've seen all the sort of stuff that was uh, been going on about all the concurrency sort of work. Have you seen yeah, any? No. Right. No. Um, so there's a whole, you know, because Alonzo is coming through. There's a whole lot of fud coming out of like the ethereum camp for starters and also um because there's a whole lot of new developers that are starting to learn about plutus and things coming in and actually testing their code on the alonzo testnet they're finding that their designs aren't actually very good right uh, because not many software developers have done much with concurrency Okay, um, you know, haven't dealt with highly distributed, highly concurrent systems before. Um, and so they've somewhat naively implemented their smart contracts and they're finding that uh, 
they don't perform particularly well um, because they're essentially sequentializing access one transaction at a time. So basically like doing a DEX where you can only do one transaction every block, uh, you know, one trade every block ain't going to scale particularly well. Um, and so of course, the FUD that's coming out is that, ah, oh, Kadano doesn't scale. Yeah, rubbish, blah, blah, blah. And so actually it does very well. <laughs> it's just that the designs aren't done properly. So um, uh, the, there's various different approaches to solving that problem. And so I uh, couldn't help myself but put that in. <laughs> um, put that into the proposal on that side. But um, more important to your question, if I can actually find the proposals on um, IV scale. Okay. Um, how do you simplify something like that? Um, these market-based mechanisms and what you're going to do, where your core idea is the idea of composition, which is these things can be built one piece at a time come together. How can you stitch them together? Now, um, that's the essential idea, but doing that is really, really hard. Oliver's done his masters in doing that, sort of the theory behind doing that, sort of some of it. Yeah, category, what was your masters in? Category theory for what particular area? Uh, representation theory, which is pure maths, but I'm moving more, <laughs> moving more towards computer science slash applied world. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a lot of the stuff there is about how to, um, in the computer science sort of stuff, what you're concerned about is how do you build little Lego blocks, basically, stitch things together, and how you do that. And you might think, well, hey, this is easy, you just glue them together through an API. But the problem is that you've got um, these things operating in a highly distributed, highly concurrent world where you've got incentives to manipulate the system and uh, their behavior is basically ends up being complex and can be quite unpredictable. Uh, so you need ways or tools about how to design them such that you understand how they actually, that they will perform correctly. So plugging two computers together will perform correctly. With the added complication is you're also plugging together humans, which are notoriously unpredictable. Um, so how do you uh, approach designing those sort of things? So... Um, but this is the proposal I found uh, for one. Hey, Robert. Yeah. Um, can I just say, like, I think that you're tackling like probably the, the number one hardest problem that we're tackling. And you're probably going to have to, I mean, you probably already realize this, you're probably going to have to sort of constrain your scope into a sort of a more sexy, buzzy kind of thing that's going to get some attention. But, um, but yeah, after listening to you for a little bit, I can definitely tell you're a very smart guy and you're definitely on the right track um and yeah i'm really thoroughly enjoying hearing you speak even if you're not in your best um <laughs> but yeah definitely back for definitely back for more because yeah i mean I, I think probably a lot of us here do think about the human element because really that's what it's all about um there's all this sort of computer stuff it's sort of for the most part you can sort of you know figure it out but how do you tie that in with humans and geez yeah that that's 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 a pretty big challenge so um, yeah, I commend you. <laughs> yeah, I, the um, it is uh, uh, how do you describe these sort of things? I mean, uh, for a, a part of it is that uh, for me, I'm also interested in. It, it would seem to me to be a real shame that we've got this incredibly well engineered base public infrastructure, you know, which is the Cardano blockchain to then go and ride uh, jalopy, build the jalopies on them, you know, uh, seems ridiculous. So um, I would like to sort of see, you know, us starting to build more, uh, approach better things in a well-designed sort of way. 
no, that's what I like doing as well. That's what I do. Um, and so, um, and, in, and in this case, I'm particularly interested in impact investing in finance. And to do these sort of things, I need tools like this to do the actual interesting you know, real world application, which is to finance innovation, to finance impact, to finance uh, change, environmental change, those sort of things. And if we're actually to do that, then we need some building blocks to actually do that. Um, and so um, trying to describe that, get that across. Yeah, I know it's hard, but yeah, that's well, okay. <laughs> as long as, as long as we enjoy playing in the sandbox and uh, as you say, we'll iteratively work towards the ultimate goal. Yeah, yeah. But it is um, interesting in terms of like what we did as a little bit of a challenge with, to ourselves, which can we actually explain these things really uh, simply in a short video? Uh, uh, what, pro probably not. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, I think for most people, I mean, how do you? I mean, you're obviously very technically minded, and not everyone is technically minded, and and, and that's got to how do you, how do you get enough eyes? On something, and I guess maybe once there's more infrastructure and um, you know people with a lot more technical background have more like like you say the reputation will have more weight to influence attention. Maybe that will be the point where you could propose something like you're proposing, and then all of a sudden you'd get attention. But at the moment, as you point out, you got like DeFi, all the sort of buzzy stuff floating around. So you're competing with things that are sort of, yeah, look they're important, but look really that's not the the ultimate. So yeah, yeah I'd like, like to I see it. I can easily go off and say, yeah, I'm doing DeFi, I can do it. I've, I've done yeah, exchanges, yeah. I've done auction protocols, I've done stuff like that. But if I can easily do those and I can give you a token drop, yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. I'll get all yeah. the attention in the world. No problem. Yeah. You just seem to let it blow over a little bit. But yeah, you'll get your time at the sounds of it. <laughs> it doesn't, that doesn't worry me. I mean, I, I enjoy what I do and I can work on things like this. So it doesn't actually worry me that much to uh, do that. Um, so. Yeah, the, mo the more interesting one for me is this uh, retroactive project funding stuff. And that's why um, uh, you know, looking at like the problems of scaling, it's useful, for example, like the problems of scaling um, uh, catalyst funding, project funding, treasury management, those sort of things. So yeah, that's one way which can be used. Uh, it's very, you could, do it for things like Kickstarter, for crowdsourcing, uh, those sort of things would be also quite useful. Um, so yeah, I'd be interested to know. There's the little little video at the bottom uh, of those proposals uh, that we've tried to do is explain things in you know, simple terms. Yeah. So. Yeah, I must admit, I haven't actually been onto the, I mean, I, it's probably my dirty secret, although I've been involved in Cardano early on, still haven't been over to the Catalyst um, yeah. <laughs> area to even read any of them, um, just so time poor, because I mean, I, I work at a university and I look after a lot of academics and core infrastructure, so I'm used to being around people in their own little bubbles and doing their things <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, 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 you know, it, I mean, it's really satisfying mentally, um, but yeah, I, I do have to deal with a whole yeah. you know array of of things so um hopefully at some point my time will free up and i get to put myself full time in the cardano world but um it, yeah it's looking like it's that's, that day is coming closer and closer so um yeah hence why i'm here tonight for the first time you know okay. sort of yeah at some point you know got to start dipping your toes in so but yeah no i'm, I'm really enjoying yeah well, i think all of you guys are fairly smart it's pr pretty impressive so do enjoy it hmm. and what areas interest you though um, yeah. Oh God. You're... Similar. You, you're you're more. I mean, you've had more formal education, but I mean, I'm probably with you in a little bit. It's it comes down to the human condition and trying to dice. You know, break that apart a little bit, and then working out well, how do you how do you design something that makes us more efficiently get along with each other. Uh, I mean, I mean, that's sort of really it. Um, but that's not an easy thing, and it's almost like you need to, like you say, modulize the whole bot. You might come up with some high-level algorithms, throw it in there, see how things get connected, and then iterate on that and experiment. You might eventually start to bring AI in, and it might start to notice that, okay, when you bring these people together and you get these kind of outcomes, and it sort of refines itself. Um, I can almost see you one day sort of 
dropping these things in and experimenting from a from a from above um, and watching it all sort of um, yeah sort of just the how humans interact yeah it's sort of but yeah as you say you sort of got to build it out um, you know at, at, at the implementation and just you know start small um, but I can sort of see where you're heading um, yeah um, well sorry actually you're asking me my background I think I'm, yeah so I guess I'm sort of interested in that I mean it, yeah it's just, I don't know it's sort of hard to get away from what you're doing is it always comes back to the humans and it doesn't matter what you're it touches on everything mm. um, and I guess that's you know you're talking about you know um, uh, what was it uh, Matala I mean that's just the the start of it all is you know proof of human because um, yeah that's that's a big problem and it's, it's a solvable problem it should have been solved a long time ago but um, when you start bringing in the digitization of of everything that's where all the efficiencies are so yeah proof of human needs to be digital so um, you know we've had um, pretty pretty cool computer stuff for 20 years now and why is that a thing so we're sort of playing catch up and all these things get it done mm -hmm. and then you can start to get to the more interesting stuff yeah um, the, but the yeah proof, proof of human one is um, actually a really hard problem really hard yeah problem, so and then uh, what happens when someone gets access to your credentials you know how do mm -hmm. you quickly revoke that and and re-repair and and things like that and, and then you've got the as you say you've got the reputation system and all this other stuff that it might be tied into and then eventually that person decides to go rogue and how do you quickly you know if someone yeah so you sort of never really want to give anything sort of too much power um i mm -hmm. guess you can sort of rely on governments to um issue um you know your your status but you know, potentially there could be a better way. Maybe that goes as far as like DNA testing and things like that, where you can use that as an identifier or an entry point. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, even even that becomes, it, it just gets, once you actually start to delve into that whole space, you realize it's, um, it's turtles all the way down. You keep coming up with problems one after the other. Um, and it's, uh, so even like the DNA problem, uh, DNA, using DNA to identify, actually DNA is not that secure. Um, so you end up with biometrics. And my favorite thing is I like my fingers. I don't, I don't want my fingers removed, thank you, or my eyes poked yeah. out or something well, else like that. Yeah. It'll probably be an array of multiple things, you know, to build yeah. a picture, I suppose. Um, and even the way you act, interact in life, like the older you are, the more provable you become because you've got more history to go off. Yeah. Oh, uh, Dippins is taking out. He's uh, just had to drop off. Um, yeah. Uh, and yeah, so it's um, the, the sort of, yeah, the proof of human one is, is a really, really hard problem to solve. Uh, and for for privacy aspects, for control aspects, I mean, like, for example, I've seen a few stories just over the last few days, whereby uh, the Afghan situation, which is, you know, the Taliban have apparently got access to all the biometric devices that have been used to record um, people, Afghanis that were working for the US government. Um, and so getting access to that it sort of all of a sudden becomes really problematic because now it can be used to identify them and, you know, basically incarcerate, kill, whatever, persecute them. Um, and so it, it's, it's problems like that. Do you let the government hold it? Well, hey, here was the US government or the uh, Afghani government at the time was collecting all of that information. Yeah, yeah they've been effectively disp disposed, but the technical systems are still in place. So you end up yeah. with all sorts of uh, gnarly problems that are really, really difficult. And, and one of the big driving problems behind all of this is, um, in, is an attempt like what Derek was talking about earlier around um, uh, risk and things like that is to do with something called uh, Siebel, attack, or a Siebel problem or sock puppets. Uh, which is basically that no one knows you're a dog, no one knows you're a bot, and no one knows you're a human on the internet. You could be any of those sort of things, and particularly with the ability of uh, uh, the, the speed at which things like um, the machine learning stuff is being applied to video production. Uh, you know, you, you just don't know who's who anymore. And so that's a perennial problem, is how do you actually try and deal with Siebel attacks? My, my attitude is uh, you don't. You deal with it. You'll never solve it. You know? So you should be actually designing your systems to adapt and adjust for that um, and to be able to respond to the fact. 
that these sort of things are going on. So that's a notion of pseudo anonymous identity rather than trying to prove someone's a human. Yeah, you don't, you don't go off and do that. You just accept that it. Could yeah, be I think you. I think. Yeah, it's it's kind of ties into just the simple idea of freedom of speech is that, you know, for 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 things to be equitable, you, you need to allow all information to flow. And, that, and I see that pattern replicating everywhere. And it's almost replicated in crypt cryptographic technology is that you can't, you need to, you know, if for people to have security, well, everyone's got to be secure. And then you'll get people saying, well, and you're doing bad things and you're getting access to tools that I can't oversight you. But at the end of the day, you sort of have to accept the fact that if, um, I think Charles sort of says it, you sort of have to have faith that the general good of people will, will shine through. And the only way that you could sort of protect that is to allow, you know, some of the, the dark, sort of darker corners to, to exist. Um, but yeah, sort of see that sort yeah. of replicated across different things. It's sort of, yeah, once again, one of these sort of human things. It's sort of interesting. It's almost like an evolution thing where, you know, you never know when those bad things might be useful. So you can never really shut it out. So it's sometimes better. It's just to learn to coexist. Yeah, that's, that's it. And I, I think, um, yeah, in general, humans cooperate. That's the, the key thing. I think that just some of the systems and stuff that we've implemented in the current today's environment amplify um, the bad rather than the good. So for me, I want to try and amplify the good. Yep. Incentivization sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, different forms are like, um, and you've got to be mindful of, of the proclivities of humans to um, object, uh, go for an objective target as well. So be very careful of that. I mean, one of, I mean, I was very early into um, the uh, Bitcoin and stuff because I was involved in the sort of financial cryptography space for quite a while. I honestly never thought Bitcoin would get off the ground. Reason, yeah, I missed the boat for the same reason. I just thought, nah. Uh, and that's because I'd come, I'd used and come across previous systems, such as uh, you know, um, that had you know, B money and um, Bit Gold and E Gold and a whole bunch of other stuff. That yeah, they're not going to go anywhere. This is this is really neat, but it's not going to go anywhere. I'll play around with it. I'll muck around with it, but it's not going to go. Um, I severely underestimated the uh, the subtle subtle trick in the um, incentive mechanism and the greed aspect to actually accelerate stuff. Yeah, so. yeah, it's a pretty powerful motivator. It's one of the big ones. That, but yeah, as you yeah. rightly point out, it's not the only one and it'd be interesting to experiment with others. Hmm. Uh, yeah, there are quite a few experiments going on in, in that space, which I think is very interesting. So yeah, uh, yeah. be cool. Yeah, All right. Ronaldo, I haven't, you haven't heard much from you at all. Oliver, you were going to say something. Sorry. No, but I was just saying, um, you know, interesting. You know, anyway, I don't know what Atala specifically aims to do. It seems like it's you have an identity issued by a government, or is it, or maybe it's meant to be like a distributed identity thing, but, you know, you'll have a sort of network of identities and, you know, you'll have like sort of, overarching emergent identities, which I guess is kind of what happens in the real world. Like you have relationships with others and, you know, your actual sort of entity, entity or identity is some collection of emergent identities for every sort of like subset of relationships with people. Um, well, it know, just, yeah, it depends on what you mean by identities. Um, and like Atala Prism itself is probably, if I was to break it down into three, uh, sort of a few component parts. One is it's a technology stack for issuing DIDs and verified claims. So DIDs are identifiers. Uh, I resolve, more importantly, resolvable identifiers. So given a DID, a technical system can resolve that DID to find out the services or endpoints that it can then call, right? So, the, uh, so a DID is just an identifier. The second component of that is that it issues, it enables um, entities, you know, organizations or anyone really to issue uh, particular documents called verified claims, which are essentially just a, um, 
JSON, a, a standard sort of schema-based document, JSON sort of based thing that is structured in a particular way that you can sign it and then you can do blinding-based signatures and um, other types of mechanisms around that. Um, and those claims, basically, the idea behind them is that um, uh, a, part, a third party um, can issue that, such as a government being the third party, to you, Oliver, to say um, X about you. So a good, good example is university transcriptions, right? Um, in the sense that, hey, you've entered, you've gone to, uh, you've done this course, you've done that course, you've passed this grade, those things. Those are all claims that the university could issue to you. And the important point here is they're issued to you and you can then use them in any way you want without the issuer knowing how you're using them. So the other component to this is that there's a third party that can then understand and interpret those verified claims. And so that means that they can take any dids that are in it and resolve those to find out, oh, that was the University of New South Wales that issued that, oh, and we trust that, and that is their public key and they've signed it, and so great. Yeah, that's a valid transcription uh, of yeah. your course. Yeah. Structure for dids and verifiable claims, just JSON. But so yeah, infrastructure. I guess I'm imagining you would get a did for a whole number, like for all the different services that you use or communities you're part of. Uh, you know, from DApps to yeah, like there's some. Um, there's there's an aspect. Yeah, there's an aspect to it, which is that uh, all pairwise interactions is defined by a did, a unique did. Okay, so for you, you would interact with lots of different organizations, but in doing so, you would never share the same did with them, with any one of them. So it's kind of like a unique user ID for each every, every one of them. But for those entities that you have to trust, like the government or university, they would have public dids that are you know, re relatively permanent or used often because they need a way for others to trust them. So that's the intention. Um, yes, yeah, so you have a different did. Is there any way to, I don't know, maybe you, have, you were just answering this and I just didn't get it. Like, is there any way to link them not not through some government, not, not through a trusted organization, but like within the, decentralized infrastructure you know right. i've got my did for me and my did for my job and i've connected them and like i can yeah. sort of like I can get, off, yeah i guess it's all just connected to your wallet address um so yes then, the the answer that's the notion of the web of trust and stuff is that um the dids and any of the verified claims could be issued by uh, non-government, non-organizational entities, right? In, in principle, the technology will do that quite fine. And there's been quite a bit of work done around that to enable sort of Weber Trust sort of work. Um, the challenge within that is to build up that Weber Trust in the first instance, um, you know, so that it goes beyond just small groups or small worlds, so on, on that um, side of things. Yeah, I can sort of envision sort of the, those trust models being um, certified so that, you know, when you have a certain relationship with someone, they get certified by a certain entity that then you go, okay, I trust that certification. Therefore, you know, that, that amount of metadata that you release to me is sufficient for me to interact with you. And I guess it's the sole, uh, I guess the, the control there is, all the power there is that you only release what's needed for that entity. But yeah, as you point out, how do you sort of certify that? And that still requires other entities to come around to sort of put their stamp on things and slowly sort of build that up. Hmm. Um, I guess that's where sort of oracles and other sort of goodies come into it. Um, it it's where uh, things like um, more community organizations or like um, here in New Zealand, for example, um, because we have a tribal based society that sits next to, next to or runs alongside effectively um, with uh, the Western sort of way of doing things. Uh, we have all these tribal organizations uh, from the tribes themselves to their small, you know, their sub-tribes um, and to the various 
companies and legal entities that uh, come out from the own resources. And they're actually quite a good uh, way of actually bootstrapping a notional web of trust because it's implicit in the tribal society already, the way the whole protocol and stuff like that works. I mean, is based on essentially web of trust uh, sort of ideas. So when I turn up to a marae, um, you know, for example, I'll get asked, who am I? And I don't start off by saying Robert O'Brien. I say, where have I come from? What, what's my mountain? What's my river? What land do I belong to? What tribe do I belong to? Uh, and then eventually I get down to, these are my parents and this is my sister. And, oh, I'm Robert, by the way. You know? um, so that's the um, sort of uh, approach to describing it. And it's, um, you know, that's, that's a way of forming and passing on information. Um, I mean, the background photos of a Faranui, which itself is actually those carvings are actually a type of ledger because they encode stories of the tribe. They encode the history like uh, totem poles in North America or the, um, the dot paintings and stuff like that of the Aboriginal. Um, yeah. Sort of I think I think some of the more simpler ones are going to be the ones that get used the first, you know, because um, yeah, that that that's a bit more intricate, but I, th I think very very cool and be very interesting to see with different communities what kind of structures that people sort of um, require to interact and yeah, um, but I think you know like if, I think it's sort of Charles mentions you know the sort of the very first iteration you know if you just want to go online and buy a pizza well, not exactly much information you need to release for, to that to, to facilitate that but if you're getting involved in something a bit more serious for well, you know you need more more infrastructure more information more, mm. more history to to build that and i guess that will just take time as, as you point out yeah and and the uh, tala prism stuff while it's a technical infrastructure built to you know use these um standards stuff not the context of use that they're going after is um, at the moment is government issued credentials in particular for education to begin with um, so that's uh, the use uh, standard model there there's nothing to say that that technology can't be redeployed into a different context for a different purpose with a different uh, user experience over the top And a big thing for using DIDs um, too, I might point out, is that actually when you're trying to interface with other systems uh, in particular. So if we were just inside the Cardano world, right, DIDs are you know, useful in the sense that it's got a resolution architecture, you know, but beyond that, it doesn't really matter that much. You know, we could just use the Cardano blockchain for, for a lot of the stuff. Uh, it's when we're trying to go out into other external systems or other interface with other entities that it that becomes important because they need a kind of technology neutral way to, to resolve uh, information about service endpoints and those sort of things. Yeah, yeah and I think, think the schematic, or at least the design for did is still being still evolving. Hmm. Um, and and yet until it, that sort of becomes more standardized, it gets very hard for other entities to sort of plug into that. And yeah, it's just going to be a bit of a bit of an experimentation. But yeah, starting small with, with very specific use cases, but you might find people have to upgrade their identities and you know, maybe some of them will get invalidated because they no longer fix the new structure. Um, but it seems like um, the guys that have at least implemented the, the initial did, it seems like a start. And I would like to think mm. that that should probably hang around. Oh, it's um, it's pretty well done. Um, it come from a background of a lot of work. I mean, I think Drummond and stuff started on the XRI specifications in the late nineties, I think is when they first started working on that sort of stuff. And it obviously it's built upon a whole lot of work in that area through the identity workshop, uh, internet identity workshop group um that has been doing standards in that area so the did stuff is actually well thought through you know the scope is really good uh, i think it will survive for quite a while um and what i've noticed like in australia and in new zealand um digital identity legislation is starting to get uh, adopted um i know in new zealand that uh that's getting pushed through for next year i think and i'm, I'm if i recall correctly there's stuff for australia going through as well and Canada. 
So um, my state was meant to issue the digital ID on blockchain. They had, that was their plan and then they pulled out at some point, bit of a shame. Yeah. I think the um, vaccine passports debate is also a spot for- It's not, I was gonna say, there's, there's, there's nothing, stop on, uh, not, uh, nothing stopping someone aggregating that data in, if you get a feed to the government issued thing is I think stopping you from, because we sort of do that in Australia, there's a, um, a party called the Flux Party and they they are implemented a sort of an Ethereum blockchain voting system. And they have a model where when you go to the um, uh, voting website, um, they have a sort of a plug in there at that, that particular moment to, you know, issue a hash based off on uh, your um, entry point there. And that just gets replicated at that, that point. And, and then that's what they use to sort of prove your identity. It's a sort of very simple, very basic implementation, but they just sort of hook into an existing government structure. So although they may not want to release that, and of course they want power and all that sort of stuff, um, they're still, you know, not so, you know, at some point someone's going to be able to sort of wire it in. So, um, but it'd be nice to see something a bit more standardized, more formalized. And I guess sometimes you just sort of play you know, I guess it's sort of Charles says that it's a bit of a win, like with central bank digital currencies, although we may not like them, it's it's a win for blockchain because they're digitizing everything and you can wrap the token, you can start to integrate and become a bit more interoperable and maybe we'll see the same thing with digital, you know, governments will do their own thing, won't quite be the same, but at least it's digital, you can sort of do a bit of dirty hacking and eventually as it makes more and more sense, um, it'll become more standardized and more prevalent, I suppose. Hmm. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you on that one. Um, it, it's an interesting, with the central bank digital currencies, it's an inter interesting one that um, how they'll go after the stable coins because essentially that's their domain. So uh, we see what uh, see what happens there. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting, yes. But the, the motivators in that one is China. China. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I might have to end up wrap up wrap up this room because I I do I'm fading fast. What is it? <laughs> is one a.m. over there. Two, two a.m. is two a.m. Oh geez, yeah, I'm 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 hitting on twelve. So yeah, you two yeah. hours ahead. So two, you're in the future, man. <laughs> yeah, two a.m. here, and uh, I've been up since four a.m. this morning. <laughs> well, yeah. I'll probably have to call it there too as well. So yeah, um, wow. So. so I'm starting to fade pretty quickly at, uh, uh, on, on that front. So I might wrap it up here, uh, the sort of two hour mark. Tisha, uh, we've got a new new name, new face. Uh, what quickly, just what brings you brings you along? I would like to learn more about what what is going on with Cardano, the ADA, and the cryptocurrency and blockchain. That's why I joined the the project catalyst in this meeting. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, you joined in just at the tail end. So as I say, I've, uh, I've had a very long day, and so I might be uh, wrapping it up. But we are going to be moving. Uh, just a reminder: we're moving just as an experiment uh, to for the Eastern Town Hall to Saturdays at nine uh, nine a.m. UTC. Uh, because that seemed to be a better time for Vietnam, Indonesia, and Japan, um, and sort of that whole area. Uh, so that's what we're doing for next week. So it won't be on Thursday, it'll be on Saturday at uh, 9 a.m. UTC. Um, how does that work for you, Ken? How does that uh, in Moali? We're, we're... Well, I'm UTC plus two, so that should be okay. Okay. And Tisha, where, where are you coming in from? Where do you, where you reside? I'm from the Philippines. Okay, so that should work so, in minus well. eight, yeah. Minus eight hours. Okay. Um, <laughs> so hopefully that sort of time will suit you a bit better. Um, uh saturday utc at nine that's we're going to try that out for a couple of weeks um and also okay. next week we'll be doing a little bit of a poll to find out what time actually suits everyone to try and sort of balance that out so um just a big heads up thank you that. for that that's no problem at all because i always fell asleep with um 3 a.m 
there was a meeting that is going on at 3 a.m. my time. Yeah. I don't know what UTC number, what what UCT, UTC time is that. So I always fell asleep. I miss out all the meetings. Yeah. In the middle of the meeting or sometimes I cannot really get in. <laughs> yeah, I, I know I, I, I know what you mean. I, I constantly make, miss meetings and stuff because I get my UTC times mixed up with the, because I'm in the future. And often people say, my, I, I'll go my Wednesday and think and they'll go oh that's our Wednesday sort of thing so we're always out by 24 hours <laughs> <You know? laughs> so it's often done like that because uh, of where we are but with that um, good to see everyone again on and the new faces as well um, and hopefully the discussion was uh, useful for you all and I will with that, I'll sort of uh, bid you farewell and go and get a bit of a sleep. But thank you very much for coming along today and hopefully see you next week on Saturday at 9 a.m. UTC. Okay. Yeah. See you all later. All right. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone else. Catch you guys later. See you. Thank you, Daniel. That's right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Is it bye-bye? Yeah, it's bye-bye. <laughs> we'll uh, see you okay. later. Bye. See you soon. See ya.